All right, um, I'll just stop the recording. Welcome everybody to chapter nine of the self-belief series. So I had no idea back when I started the self-belief series last year, how many people I would interview, as many of you know, because the idea just came to me when I was walking along the beach, as all of my great ideas do. And so last year I interviewed eight different people. At first I thought I was just going to interview women, but I didn't. I interviewed six women last year and two men. And now out of the blue, I have invited invited Sunny Roberts to talk to us today. Hi, Sunny. How are you going? Hi, Tracy. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited for our chat today. Oh, you're welcome. It's so good to have you here. So I just want to give you all a little bit of background before I start chatting to Sunny about how Sunny and I met. So many of you will know some of the story, but not all of it. So I'm going to share it all for those of you who don't know it. So in 2016, my mum passed away in January and I ended up on a flight begrudgingly, I would have to say, in February. So only a month later, I didn't really feel ready to be going anywhere, particularly somewhere where I had to work and somewhere where I was going to have a big team and, and have a lot of responsibility. But I was still a people pleaser at the time and I felt obliged and I didn't want to let people down. There were a lot of people going to Noosa at the time with one of the businesses I was in and I know that they all really wanted me to be there. So I got on the plane and off I went. But then when I got on the plane, I sat next to a guy and I saw what he was doing on his laptop and I started chatting to him about it because I recognised it. And it turned out that it was Andrew Roberts, which is Sonny's husband, and we just completely hit it off. And I probably didn't make this realisation at the time, but on reflection, I could see that he was the male version of me. <laughs> so I was sitting next to my male twin and we had so much in common. So very entrepreneurial, very excited about learning new things, doing new things, both very passionate about helping other people, both coaches and both big fat people pleasers. So we had that in common. And interestingly, the thing that we actually ended up chatting about because of what I was on my way to do was Jeunesse, because at the time that was the business that I was off to talk about in Noosa. And so I talked a little bit about um, Jeunesse and what I was doing and the fact that it was anti-aging. So <laughs> this is so funny. So he's like, you know, noticed my skin and then Sonny what did he say to you about the lady that he met on the plane can you remember something like I met this amazing lady on the plane you should really buy her skincare products <laughs> <laughs> so that's the last thing I think you want to hear from your husband is that he met this amazing lady on the plane <laughs> you said he's a people pleaser as well he was clearly people pleasing you there I was like okay <laughs> but not you <laughs> No, no, it was people pleasing you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really funny because that was really Sunny's first introduction to me, even though she didn't meet me, she just heard about me, which I think is really funny. I love these stories when you look back in hindsight and thought, okay, so the first impression Sunny has of me is I'm some random woman who <laughs> sat next to him and pretty much sold him a skincare range <laughs> for his wife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so then the first time I met Sunny, so down the track, so we sold to each other really. So that's so funny because we're entrepreneurs. So he, he encouraged his wife to buy my skincare. And then I ended up being one of his clients because he's a business coach. So Mary and I, with our physiotherapy business, started to work with Andrew. And part of the program that he was running at the time included a live event. So Mary and I came to the live event, and this was my first opportunity to meet Sunny. Mm -hmm. And Sunny was running a yoga class um, mm -hmm. early in the morning before our sort of entrepreneurial business marketing workshop. And I fell in love with Sunny at first sight. I've never told her that before. Um, no, you haven't. Sunny. <laughs> Um, she's beautiful and has this energy of just being completely calm and completely welcoming and just has this amazing accent. And I'm a sucker for accents. I married an Irishman. So <laughs> now I had this beautiful German accent um, and just loved her yoga class. So can you remember that, Sunny? 
I totally remember that we practiced yoga in the hotel. I was quite new as a yoga teacher back then, but yeah, I was so passionate and loved teaching. I think in particular people who usually don't do yoga. I think that's my favorite clientele actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that really shines through because Sunny has also taught yoga to the members of the Farm Owners Academy um, mm -hmm. and she teaches yoga at my retreats and mm -hmm. we have all sorts of people at the retreats. Some have never done yoga before and some have and, and I think it is a beautiful yoga class for that reason because I always say that it's like meditation in motion which I really love mm. yeah so we met first then and then the next time we met was something that was really outside of my comfort zone so back at the time I was this high achieving perfectionist who was a workaholic and running three businesses and I was invited to a retreat and at the time that was way out of my comfort zone even though I run retreats now and so the retreat was being run by Sunny and Andrew together and I came into that retreat space very uptight very anxious very nervous and met Sunny again and again felt really drawn to her because she seemed so calm um she seemed to float <laughs> and I was like I want a bit of that so I just wanted to start with that introduction to give you all an idea of how we met and my first impressions of Sunny but of course what we all know is that our first impressions of people do not tell the whole story about a person and it doesn't even really tell the story about how they're actually feeling when you meet them because you might have a different perception about them than what's really going on. So before I start at the beginning with you I'd love to know did you have any nervousness about running that retreat with your husband or were you as calm as you appeared? I had a bit of nervousness about that particular one because it was with Andrew and I felt a bit of pressure because it was his clients and I wanted to do a really good job. But in generally, I never feel nervous sharing yoga because why don't I feel nervous doing that? I just feel... Yeah, I feel calm doing it. It feels not hard for me. It feels natural and I'm never not nervous doing it. And it feels, I feel nervous doing it once I start to overthinking it and questioning it. But when I'm in my heart and just do what I do, no, I don't feel nervous. And I am I was able to shake that really fast. I was like, okay, it's Andrew's clients. I need to do a good job, but let's just, you know, do what I do. And as soon as I, and I always put the same music on, as soon as I hear the music, I fall into my heart and I just do what I do. And it's usually very easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is such a good example of self-belief because I think all of us can experience that, that in the moment when something's going to be different, mm -hmm. when we feel some pressure, when there's some weight attached to it. So this is your husband. He's very <laughs> successful as a business coach. The people in the room are paying him a lot to be his business coach. And now this is included. And when we start to think those things, our self-belief can wobble. But yeah. then when you brought yourself back to that confidence and that knowing that when you're in your heart space, which is so connected to yoga, then you can be who you really are. And that's where true self-belief comes from. Because when I talk about self-belief, I'm really talking about the self with a capital S. And what I mean by that is our soul and our true self. And I think that trying to believe in the conditioned personality is always going to be challenging because there is so much influence around that side of ourselves. Whereas when we're really centered and we're being who we truly are and we relax into that, mm -hmm. then being ourselves is what brings us authentic confidence because we're not trying to prove anything and we're not trying to be anything that we're not. So let's go back right to the beginning. Mm -hmm. My belief is that when we decide to pop into physical form, that we know who we are and we burst into the room and we have complete belief in ourselves, but then other humans come onto the scene and we start to learn some different things. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody's self-belief journey is very different depending on the humans that are around them once we jump into this physical life. Mm -hmm. So take me back to oh. when you were young, when did you first experience anything that was different to self-belief, any, any lack of confidence or any self doubt I guess 
how real and how deep one you want to go. Should I throw the full load on you? Yeah, yeah. Give it to right. us. We're we're here for it. So yeah, well, it's it's a bit of the story of my family, and I think every family has a story. And I did a lot of work around that. That's why I can talk about it like it is. So I 100% agree with everything what you said, and it's, uh, we come into the world as these pure souls, and we're nothing but love. But then, of course, we come into a family with con conditions and circumstances. And the circumstance in the family that I was born in was that I we used to be three children, and my sister died before I was born. So my parents had two children, um, a boy that was seven and a girl. She was 12 at the time she died. So my parents went through that very traumatic loss of losing a child at the age of 12. And then after that, um, it was back then in the 80s. So there was no psycho, like, you know, no help whatsoever. So what they did as people did back then was in the community they were in and they didn't know any better. They just went back to work and kind of suppressed that and just worked harder. And um, a year later, my mom felt pregnant again. And that was me. So I was pretty much conceived in that space of deep, you know, emotional upheaval, trauma and sadness. And that has a lot to do with how I was brought up and the story of who I became, because what that resulted in was that I was, of course, loved like nothing else, you know, because I was the angel that came in to replace, I was, they call it a replacement child. It's a thing when a sibling dies, there comes a child in who is replacing um, the dead child. So uh, it turned out for me to have come some funny beliefs. So I was very spoiled as a child. I think there were not a lot of boundaries. I was showered with love, but I also knew that business was always first because my parents were very hard workers. So um, mom was not home a lot she spent a lot of time working because that was her coping strategy with this whole traumatic event um my brother of course was very jealous and i totally understand because you know i was the center of the universe but what i also learned and some funny things and people are very shocked at hearing that but children don't questions i always thought i would die as well when i was 12. Wow, and yeah. then i was very surprised how i still was alive after mm -hmm. that um, yeah, people go, wow, but it was just, you know, that's what happens to girls in our family. We die when we're 12. Yeah. Um, and what happened then later on in life was that I understood that I was the little one. So there's a 10 year age gap between me and my brother, that I was not really seen for who I was because I was seen as the replacement child. And there's a lot of like, I think some, I think Van Gogh or someone was like, I started studying it later on in life when I had my little breakdowns and, and, you know, I started questioning who the hell am I and why am I the way I am? And I learned um, through some modalities that I did, like one was a family constellation that because I wasn't really seen for who I was as a person, because I was just a replacement for my sister. I was loved, but sometimes my dad would even not call me my name. He would call me her name. So that was, <laughs> it was a thing. Yeah. I became very rebellious because I was like, this is me please see me for who i am like i am me and then i started doing things that were rebellious like getting a tattoo and doing all the things that my parents didn't like and um <laughs> and i think that's why i became very independent from a very young age and what is the self-belief i probably always thought and i healed that later in life i I'm not really seen for who I am. Or I'm not really loved for who I am. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah completely, yeah. completely. Mm -hmm. One of the conversations I had with a guy today, um, we were talking about his daughter with an eating disorder and how he can, you know, support her through that. And I was saying, um, you've got this because you completely believe in her. Mm -hmm. And that belief, that self-belief that she's looking for and grappling with we can sometimes get it from the absolute unconditional belief that somebody else has in us. And I think that our parents are those key people when we're younger. And so if we have their 100% belief in us for who we are, 
then that really builds the self-belief. So it makes sense that if you felt like a replacement and didn't feel seen for your authentic self, yes. that it was difficult for you to be able to be proud of your authentic self and believe in your authentic self, which is the only self worth believing in. There's no point in constructing one and trying to believe in that. It, you know, We can choose who we want to be and we can become who we choose to be, but there's something so unique about us that that is really our superpower and that's what really feeds true self-belief. So I think that that explains really well your unique self-belief story, which is fantastic. We've never heard one like that. It's amazing. Mm. And so you've, you've obviously done a lot of work on that and you ended up, talk about how you ended up in Australia. Yeah, and that's part of self-belief story. I think as a teenager and in my 20s, I didn't understand any of those things. So I think what happened is I attached my self-belief to things. So first of all, it was my career. I was in HR and I was in a big corporate um, career trajectory and all my self-belief was um, attached to my business card. See, this is me, I'm an HR manager. And then when that turned to, um, I don't want to use the word, I'm not swearing. When that went down the toilet, let's say like that, <laughs> at the age of 28, um, that like was a big eye opener. And the year before, actually, you know, the same year, my first relationship of five years fell apart in not a very nice way either because I was cheated on. Um, so those two things I attached my belief on, my big job and my relationship both of that just crumbled away at the age of 28 and that's when I said okay let's screw all of this I'm just going to Australia now because um I feel yeah I wanted to be a yoga teacher I think back then I discovered yoga because I had that big burnout in corporate and I realized how much I was stuck in my head in my 20s and I pretty much came to Australia and then I did all the soul searching and like who am I without that relationship who am I without that business card like you know and that's where the whole soul pleaser comes in I'm a soul and you know what is my self-worth without all those things yes yeah absolutely so tell me um when you're cheated on what does that do to your self-belief how does that make you feel in that moment it crumbled and crushed me because it was not so much a cheating, it was the lying because he was hiding it. So I felt betrayed. And then I didn't trust in myself anymore because I was feeling if he lied about this, what else did he lie about? And what else was there that I wasn't seeing? So that crumbled and crushed me. But I think in the end, as so many breakdowns in our lives, it made me stronger because that got me to do the work. Yeah. And also, as you know now, that when we don't trust somebody else and they prove that we have good reason not to trust them. And it's always a reflection on our self-trust. And there is such a close alliance between self-trust and self-belief. When we know who we are, we feel free to be who we are. We can believe in ourselves and trust ourselves and trust life. And it's really interesting that you decided to move countries. I remember when I was 17 and I went to America as an exchange student mm -hmm. and I reinvented myself because nobody knew me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't anyone's daughter, anyone's sister, mm -hmm. you know, what? nobody knew anything about me. And I usually am afraid of fast things, <laughs> which a lot of people will know because when I came back to Australia, I went back to being like that. But nobody knew that about me. And we went skiing one one winter with the family and um, I went on the black slopes. <laughs> that was so out of character for me, but I was able to be whoever I chose to be in that moment. And I think that it can be a great opportunity to start with a clean slate to discover who you are and discover what you want without any influence outside of yourself, which is the people pleasing part of it. You know, I think a lot of people who have done the soul pleaser program say to me, I didn't actually even identify as a people pleaser, mm -hmm. but I think that whenever we're influenced by anybody else, that is the opposite to soul pleasing. We mm -hmm. want to be able to bring ourselves back to the self, to the soul and follow that rather than what we think our parents want us to do. Or, you know, it was a part of you that felt pressure to live up to this sister mm. that you never met you know and so being able to escape from that allowed you to find you 
I 100% agree with you. And it was also after, you know, the relationship breakdown, leaving the corporate career, like nothing was left. It was a completely clean slate. And yeah, yoga was helping so much because yoga helped me to go on that journey within and then, you know, realizing, okay, I'm a soul, I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience and my worth as a person is not attached to anything, you know, I'm, I'm born worthy, you know, and that was yeah. so helpful. And the other thing that people might find very interesting, I'm a big believer in past lives and I lived in America a year beforehand and coming to Australia, Australia was always calling me for whatever reason. And when I came to Australia, I felt at home. I never felt at home in Germany growing up. I always felt out of place. Yeah. And I completely feel at home here. And yeah. it's just so random because, yeah, the yeah, first time I stepped my foot in Australia was at the age of 29 then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that if we do tune into our souls, wild horses couldn't hold us back. You know, a lot of people asked me how I transitioned from running three very successful businesses to just taking this leap of faith and starting a business called Soul Pleaser, you know, after being in the medical or science world. And my logic questioned the hell out of it. But my soul <laughs> was pulling me so strongly that wild horses couldn't stop me. And I just think that sometimes it takes a breakdown. For me, it was mum dying. And for you, it was, you know, the job and the boyfriend and when, when these things happen and we trust ourselves and follow it, it really leads us to our home, which is ourself, whether that be physical, but mostly that going internal and, and aligning with who we are. So I love your story because I can really relate to it. Even though I didn't learn to become a yoga instructor, I found myself in this holding pattern for a little while between being a workaholic you know, a bit like you in the corporate world, but just with businesses, and then really taking it easy <laughs> from one extreme to the other. It was actually like I had this enormous sleep debt and I just needed to recover, you know, so I rested more than I had my entire life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were in this yoga phase, you know, Byron Bay, hippie kind of, you know, chilled, loving it. When did that change? When did you kind of transition back into the real world, so to speak? Yeah, well, I did a lot of soul searching there, right? There was all sorts of experiences, including ayahuasca journeys. So there was not only hippie, there was also a lot of work, you know, that was done, um, including reconnecting with my family and starting to accept them for who they are and not wanting to change them anymore. I think that was huge. So there was a lot of work to be done. Um, on the internal, not so much probably on the external, I was waitressing a bit. Um, but your question was, when did I transition back into the real world? Well, I met Andrew, right? <laughs> That's what I thought your answer might be. <laughs> and so, you know, with self-belief, I think if we look at your journey, there was a lack of self-belief right from the beginning because you came in under these unusual circumstances yeah. to replace somebody else. And then you found yourself by being able to kind of shut the world out a little bit and go into the self-discovery world. But mm -hmm. then you attracted into your life someone very much like your mother who, you know, runs a business and is high energy, highly motivated, similar to where you'd st started to go in the corporate world where you push yourself and attach to that mm -hmm. and then there can be a wobble in the self-belief again because it's like okay I found it when life was easy but how do I transition mm -hmm. in a world where there's a, some expectations on me again mm -hmm. and how did you find that? Um, yes so I think first of all I think the difference with Andrew compared to my first relationship was I did all that healing in Byron Bay and even before Byron Bay and I think the big breakthrough was like a family constellation that I did where I realized that this whole dynamic of a replacement child caused a pattern in my relationships for not being seen for who I am as well so it like really ran through my life and after I had the awareness and healed that Andrew like I remember I was like then the secret came out, I read the secret and I was remembering sitting on that meadow back home in Germany and writing out, this is my perfect man. And I still have that journal and it's pretty much, pretty much Andrew. <laughs> it's funny. And he was the first one actually who like sees me, the real me. 
but of course he's also very much a businessman and that yeah was shaking me a lot because I was deep in the whole yogic like oh let's just you know all make flower crowns <laughs> who needs money anyway <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and then there's another level of pressure and because I have the absolute privilege of being really close to both of you yeah. you know I've been able to see the two of you navigate that since we met you know mm -hmm. and now spirituality and all of mm -hmm. that is really high on Andrew's agenda yeah. so you know, I, I say to people, when you're impatient with your partner's growth, don't be because it's all yep. perfect. And yep. when you meet and somebody sees you for who they really are, you know, I wrote a list as well before I met Damien, a few years before I met Damien, and I never mentioned um, where he would come from. Like, you know, like it never occurred to me to say, you know, that he should have a... Um, residency in the same country as me for example um you know and and he is everything that I was looking for and again it was purely somebody just loving me for who I am that's what I wanted mm -hmm. um so it's really you know you know that these are the people that you're going to grow with when it, you come together like that and so keep trusting that as sometimes you butt heads a little bit because you're at different stages of your growth um and so you went through that journey and you did get back into the corporate world before you mm. had children. And then I think becoming a mother is another chapter mm. to the self-belief story again. What Shoot. was that for you? So I think uh, when we talk later about what I do now, I think I was on the right trajectory with the yoga and the yoga is part of what I do now. But I think that's when I doubled out of self-belief because I thought I needed to go back into corporate because that's what I knew, especially being pregnant and having children. And that felt very much at home. And I know I'm good at that, right? And then being a mom, yes, completely shook my world again. And I had two babies who were not that well at the start because they had very upset tummies. One had reflux, both of them had food intolerances. So I was the mum in the um, mum's group with a screaming baby when all the other babies were just fat and happy, smiling, right? <laughs> so that was questioning. I was questioning myself a lot. And um, I think it took me a good, God, how old is, oh my God, four years to get my head around it and, and rediscover the part of myself that is really, really spiritual. Um, again, at the last retreat, right? When I was just happy the whole time and grateful because, oh my God, I rediscovered myself. So yes, um, self-belief took a big hit then. And yes, um, motherhood now it's good, but I wish I would have had a guide through that because it does shake your whole world so much, yes. Yeah. I think it's so important for us to talk about it and be honest to it because I think that people post now that we have live in a world of social media, people portray the beautiful side of being a mother and it puts a lot of pressure on everybody else thinking, oh, it's just all, you know, unicorns and sunshine when you have a baby. And I think it's really important for us to be open and honest about what a shock it can be. Um, particularly because nobody's honest about it. <laughs> so therefore, you, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. We keep doing it. We keep going back because obviously it is beautiful. It's, it's such a gift. Um, but there are so many challenges. And I, I remember after I had Anna, I went back and did my first lecture in my business as a physiotherapist and I'd lost my confidence. So not only did I totally lose my confidence in myself because I thought I was useless as a mother, because she woke up every 45 minutes and I fed her not knowing what else to do. So I was breastfeeding every 45 minutes. So, um, but then I went back to work and I was really nervous then to show up and do what I did before I had a baby. So I wasn't confident as a mum, and then I wasn't confident back in the corporate world. So it's just acknowledging that our self-belief is attached to how good we are at something Yes. And whether we're succeeding at it. So we're actually putting these conditions on our self-belief. And I think that's really where we go wrong. I 100% agree with you. And I think that's why maybe samba is so good for me. So I took up dancing after um, I had my children. And it's the most random thing. I never danced in my life before. And I always had that little voice in my head saying, go dancing, go dancing. I was like, why go dancing? I don't dance. 
And then I started dancing samba and it's all these outrageous costumes, right? Outrageous. And these girls, they walk like walking on a catwalk, completely confident. I was like, what is this? Completely outside my comfort zone. But you know what it taught me? Um, it taught me to be comfortable being really not good at it, not good at something, really crap at something, but I really enjoyed it. And I feel that's what children do. Children do just whatever they want to do and it doesn't matter if they're good at it. So I think that taught me a lot. Absolutely. And, a lot Absolutely. Of and I've yeah. seen that change in you mm -hmm. from the time that you had your children. You know, Sunny and I have stayed very close and kept in touch mm -hmm. and we've always been really vulnerable and honest with each other. Mm -hmm. And I saw you lose your confidence when you had your babies, which is totally understandable, particularly when they keep you awake all night. Lack of sleep will make anyone lose self-confidence, you know, when you're exhausted and trying so hard to do a good job. And I really saw that change in you with the dancing. I think that it was an amazing choice for you to make. And then that led into the most recent retreat. So we're in September now. It was in August. So it's really only a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. And you were on such a high when you picked me up from the hotel to take me to the retreat. You were so excited. And it had just been so long since you'd been able to. You'd actually come and done the yoga for me at the previous retreat. Mm -hmm. But to come and actually be at the retreat and be a participant and be involved in the retreat, you were really looking forward to it. It was so exciting for you. It was so exciting for me. And I think just having that time to myself, I think all mums know it's just so precious. It's so precious. And of course, you know, like also with a relationship by then now, we, Andrew and I are married for seven years. And I think what you said earlier, I just have to come back to it because I was thinking about it. There's so much truth to that. We have to be patient with our partners because I think honestly, when we first met, he had his foot way deeper in the business world and I had my foot so deep in the spiritual world. But I feel now seven years on, we're on the complete same page. It's crazy. Yeah. And I was just so happy to come on retreat. And that's when I rediscovered that spiritual side of mine that I lost, I felt through motherhood. Yeah. And I remember we were doing a two hour silent um exercise where we couldn't talk to anyone two hours. And I was just sitting there and I was just grateful. I never felt that level of gratitude in my whole life Tracy like on that retreat and I started crying the whole time I was like I don't even know why I cried I'm just so happy I'm just so grateful it felt like my heart was too big to be contained by my body like it felt like an out-of-body experience it was so bizarre yeah. and I didn't even know why there was no reason like yeah. just well it was coming home for you it was like you'd found spirituality found your soul found your true self connected with that met Andrew, had a slight shift in it, but then kids like just yanked you out of it altogether because where was the time, you know, to meditate and all of those things. And then you built your self-belief through the Zumba that got you to the place where you could be really excited and say, I deserve to go to a three-day retreat. Here you go. Don't yep. call me. I'll call you. And so you were so excited and so ready for that. And I just absolutely love the conversation we had in the car because <laughs> the the second your second pregnancy it came quicker than you expected oh, so gosh. you yeah. were still in the middle of all of the drama around the illness and everything with the first child and next thing you were pregnant and that was the last time we'd had a car trip um and I actually called an intervention because it was not sunny sitting in the car. You were devastated at the time. And so then to get into the car this time around and see your enthusiasm and your excitement, there had just been so many shifts since then. Um, and there was, you were so excited. You were excited about your new venture, your new business that you're starting now. And there was this little bit of doubt and you just were firing questions at me and looking for something from me to be able to help you and this is this is really when we're guided by our soul this is what happens mm. right place at the right time it mm. was it was me that needed to be there it was you that needed to be there you had to be feeling those things and feel safe to ask those questions can mm. you share with everybody the conversation as much as you can remember that we had in the car on the way to the retreat yeah it was huge I yeah huge Tracy um we were in the car and I was talking to Tracy and saying 
Tracy, something huge happened in my life. I had just had this biggest shift. I don't even know. Like, it's completely crazy. And I started talking about the shift that I had. And the shift was that um, I had a huge shift in my relationship. And it was that I realized that I have been a control freak my whole life without even wanting to be a control freak. And the impact that had in general in life, but in particular on my relationship. And control freak, not in the obvious way, right? It was the obvious ways, but it also is a very unobvious ways to control, like making helpful suggestions and, you know, taking over and just, you know, needing, you know, needing to have my say all the time and needing to have things my way. And I had no idea how bad I was. And it was just that journey that I was in. And to be honest with you, our relationship um, went into a real, especially after children and the pressure that gave to the relationship. And we went through Corona and we had influence, like we had everything, influenza A. We really had that breakdown at some stage. And after that followed the breakthrough where I realized, oh my God, it's actually not him that needs to change. It's actually me. And you know and what I loved when you told me about that is you said, right, we're going to therapy because yeah. you need to be fixed. <laughs> you need to change. <laughs> and you said... And we went to therapy and it turns out it was me. <laughs> that was my absolute breakdown slash breakthrough moment. We only went to one therapy session. I was like, right, finally, someone else is going to tell him how he needs to change. And I never consciously admit that because, I, you know, I was always like, it takes two to tango. I was saying all the right things. But deep down, if I'm really honest, I thought it was him. And then I walk, walked out like that small out of the therapy <laughs> session. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's me. And yet control was at the heart of it and control and around showing up in my masculine. And then I went on that crazy journey of learning how to trust. And I think that's a lot has to do with soul pleasers, trusting in the universe. But, you know, being more feminine in your relationship, trusting your man, um, letting him be the man. and. Um, yeah, our relationship changed. I can't tell you how much it changed. And that's why I was so excited. I was like, Tracy, oh my God, there have to be more women out there that are secret control freaks that might even not know that they're control freaks. I need to tell everyone, why isn't that stuff taught in school? And then I thought, Tracy, but I'm such a private person. I don't want to talk about that stuff. Like it's the most vulnerable thing you can talk about your relationship. It's not something that I'd like to talk about. And then I remember you saying, Sunny, if you want to help people, you have to share your story and you have to be honest. And I was like, right, okay, let's do this. Yeah. And it was such a big turning point for you because the other thing is that you were going into a retreat where most of the ladies know Andrew. They yeah. know you, but they particularly know Andrew. And so for you to go in and talk about your relationship with him can feel like you're throwing him under the bus a little bit, yeah. even though you're taking full responsibility, you know, that's personal and that's private. But I have found that the reason Soul Pleaser has been so powerful is that there is nothing that I won't say. And that's because if I leave certain things out people are actually going to have more pressure on themselves because it will look like I'm perfect. I mean, everybody knows that a person can't be perfect, but if we only say what we want to say, then we're really leaving the story out. And that's dangerous. That's really dangerous because people need to be able to relate and people can have a breakthrough by hearing somebody else say something mm -hmm. very vulnerable, very honest and it changes their life because they're not the only one all of a sudden they're not the only one and they don't feel alone we had one of our soul pleasers in the unlimited joy group recently share a very vulnerable story about um, abuse from a past partner including sexual abuse and it was very interesting how many people commented on her post to say that they had experienced it as well and people keep the secret because they're ashamed Mm. And there is nothing to be ashamed of. And in fact, there was so much healing going on in there because everybody that was ashamed was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one. This, yes. I didn't deserve this. I didn't make that happen. And it just creates a really safe space for people to heal. It is. 
I couldn't agree more with you, Tracy. It is so powerful. And I experienced that on retreat because no, I'm not saying I have the most wonderful husband in the whole world. He, I call him my blue friendly spirit. He's absolutely amazing. But I'm now ready to clean up my side of the street and be open and honest about the part that I'm taking because I want to help others. And when I started talking about me, you know, and the dynamic in our relationship and how I was controlling that where other women were going like, oh, <laughs> I'm doing the same. And I was like, oh, okay. And it felt empowering. It didn't feel vulnerable. I was not expecting that. I didn't, it didn't expect to feel empowered by it, but it's empowering. Yes. Yeah, it really is. Mm. And it's validation that your idea is not unique. You know, I think even when I started from people pleaser to soul pleaser, a part of me thought maybe I'm the only one only in the one world <laughs> that people pleases this much. I mean, maybe some people do it a bit, but maybe I'm just a complete nutbag in terms of how much I people please. But no, <laughs> I have met many of people who, had, who have been just as much as me. Um, and so there is a real link between controlling and insecurity and insecurity is a lack of self-belief. So when we trust, it's because we believe in the self and the self is this enormous loving presence that we're all a part of. And when we know that we're not alone, which links in with the vulnerability and telling the truth and, you know, talking about these deeper things, when we know that we're not alone, we know that we're part of something that's bigger than us, then we feel safe. We feel loved without conditions. We don't have to be good at something. We can be ourselves. We can be authentic. We can discover the truth about us and just live more of that. And it can be just this wondrous discovery each day, more and more about who we are and what lights us up. And so I think that helping people to let go of control allows them to trust themselves and to trust life. I 100% agree with you. And that's how I see also the, how soul pleaser works. It's really about the trust in the universe, like the universe has your back. I think the layer that I came from as well in is the trust in the relationship. And I didn't realize how I was on a deep level not trusting Andrew, you know, or you know, showing up in a way that he felt I didn't trust him. I probably didn't, I probably thought I trust him and I did trust him, but I, I showed up in a way in a relationship that make him feel I wouldn't trust him. So I feel there's like, there's those levels of trust, right? The levels of trust in the universe, but within the relationship, you also need to trust your man and into the goodness of your man. And you need to decide early on, okay, am I, with a good man, is that a person worth trusting? And if the decision is yes, and the answer is yes, you need to let go of control and you need to trust him. Interesting. Same way you trust in the universe. Yeah. So, like, yeah. And it's interesting that you had the history of having a relationship that was not trustworthy. You know, that person could not be trusted. And we think that we've dealt with that and we think that we've found the new person. And because it's a new person, we will trust them. But it's really interesting to discover that because we learnt the lack of trust when we were younger, that we can bring it into the next relationship. My, um, I haven't had the experience of someone being unfaithful to me, but I had the experience of my father being unfaithful to my mother. Mm. And so I didn't trust my dad. And I had fear of abandonment because he used to pack his bags and I used to cry at the front door begging him to stay. And so my husband, who has never done anything, anything for me to be worried about him leaving, about every year I will have a nightmare that he has an affair and leaves me. And I wake up so upset and, and it's a joke now. And he'll go, what, I had an affair last night. And I'm like, yes, you bastard, <laughs> you know, like jokingly, because he doesn't have a bone in his body that would allow him to do that. It has nothing to do with him. And I can just laugh about it now. And it's only in my dreams. It's not something I would ever think, but it's just recognizing how that is still alive. Like that little thing because of my past is still alive in there. And so I think that when we, realize and I and I think what's great about what you're going to teach is that some people like you until you went to the counselor didn't even know you were controlling until you learned about what the symptoms are and how they show up yes yeah. 
Yeah. A hundred percent. So um, there'll be people who are on this call now and people who will watch the recording who will really benefit from what you're going to teach. So can you just explain um, how they can get in touch with you so that they can find out about your course? When do you, when are you launching the program? So um, the program is called Wholehearted Woman. It will launch on the 7th of February next year. And it's an eight week course where I take people pretty much through the journey that I had um, from, you know, I, I want to work with women who were like me, like showing up in their masculine in the relationship, which shows up as being controlling and needing to be in charge and, and all of the things. And I'm happy to chat more about it to make sense, right? To trusting and allowing yourself to be in your feminine and oh my god the transition and the connection you feel in the relationship will be like absolutely transformed so I feel like yeah on the 7th of February next year I'm going to start and I'm looking to work with a group of people to hopefully have the same transformation that I had. Fantastic and how can people get oh, yeah. in touch with you Sunny? How can people get in touch with me? So you um can write me an email at sunny.roberts.coach at gmail.com or you can find me at wholehearted woman on um, Instagram, um, Facebook, wholehearted woman, Sunny Roberts Coach. Um, you'll find me. Yes. Yeah. So sunny as in the word sunny, like it's a sunny day, sunny Roberts. Even if you, I found that when I search sunny Roberts on Instagram, wholehearted woman comes up as well. But even if you find her personal one, you'll be able to message her through that as well on Facebook or Instagram. So Sunny, it's just, I'm so excited for you. I'm so happy for you. I know that you're going to make an amazing coach because you are doing it. Well, first of all, you've been called by your soul. Absolutely. You like wild horses wouldn't stop you from doing it. You're so excited about it. I, I know when someone's found their soul's calling because I remember when Soul Pleaser came to me and it you just become obsessed with it in a really positive way because it just feels so amazing. Um, and Sunny is just all about the service, about helping other women get the transformation. Um, so if this resonates with you at all, reach out to Sunny. Sunny, thank you so much for coming along today. It's been beautiful chatting with you. I love you so much. Oh, thank you for having me, Tracy. Ditto. I love you so much. I can't wait to spend more time and going on for, um, hopefully on lots and lots of retreats together. <laughs> yes. And for those of you who are booked into my future retreats, Sunny is back as the yoga instructor, okay. which everyone's really excited about. So she's always there doing that. So thank you so much to the ladies who have come live. Really wonderful to have you here. And I'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, ladies.